Okay, welcome to Into the Channel podcast, primarily about women's football. Before we hit the pitch, if you enjoy the show or love women's football as much as your boys do, come kick it with us already. Subscribe, follow YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to watch or listen. Comments, ratings, reviews, always appreciated at ITC underscore pod on X. I am your host, Dino DeCespedes, and as always... I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Grant Engel. What is up, man? I'm feeling fantastic, buddy. So fantastic. We're cracking the beer out of the gate here. I mean, go. the level of football that we've been experiencing. That's such a satisfying sound. Let me, let me drink to the football here. Love it. Jiminy Christmas, buddy. This was a lot of good <laughs> football. I enjoyed the CONCACAF W Gold Cup. I love the UEFA Nations League. This opening weekend of NWSL was phenomenal. And on top of that, now the Champions League is back. It doesn't get any better than this. I'm still trying to figure out what we did to deserve all this. Just an unbelievable week in the women's football calendar. Head still kind of spinning from all the uh, NWSL action. So much to talk about. Like I said, the champions league is back (laughs) what a time to be alive we're going to preview all four matches in order to get you in order to get me in order to get everyone really back into true championship form tuesday march 19th 1 45 p.m all times eastern daylight time here sorry man Mm. we're going to watch ix take on chelsea 4 p.m tuesday benfica leon Wednesday, March 20th, 1.45 p.m., BK Hacken, PSG, and in the most prime of primetime slots, 4 p.m. Eastern, Braun, Barcelona. Shout out to the schedule makers on this one. I love closing the week with a Mike Breen NBA Finals Game 7 level bang. Apologies for vaporizing all drama surrounding my usual where you want to get started. We're just going to head to the Netherlands. I'm going to pass you the mic. I previously called this maybe the most up-in-the-air quarterfinals tie left on the board. Ajax versus Chelsea. Where do you want to get started with this one? Ajax versus Chelsea. Let's talk about the home side first in this one. Ajax has already reportedly sold more than 30,000 tickets for this match at Johan Cruyff Arena. We need to do this as a show sometime, and maybe I'll just take it on as homework. Um, I want to see how many Johan Cruyff Arenas are around the world because because <laughs> barcelona also plays at johan cruyff arena yeah. or johan cruyff stadium or something like that so i'm gonna set the over under at 15 and a half and we'll see how many we can find around there they could meet up in the next round so that, that'd be exciting easy to <laughs> remember from, easy to remember where they're playing <laughs> from cruyff to cruyff that makes yeah. sense I mean, I think it's safe to say the atmosphere there is probably going to be absolutely electric. Ajax have won their last six matches, and they haven't lost in their last seven. Their last loss was that 3-1 defeat to PSG in a Champions League play in January. In those six consecutive victories, they've outscored their opponents 21-4. to And that obviously includes their 3-0 win over top of the table FC Twente uh, a few weeks ago. Hmm. I think it is worth noting, and this is kind of a part of why we wanted to do this preview show, it's worth noting that the club announced Ashley Weirden will be out for two months with a knee injury. That's a big bummer. She played the full 90 in all six of Ajax's group stage matches at left back. So it would be silly to overlook that. I mean, you you lose your stalwart left back and how important that piece is on the chessboard. That's got to be a significant blow to the back line. Mm-hmm. That kind of leads me to the question, aside from trying to make up for Weirden's absence, what does Ajax need to do in this one to either steal it outright or just walk away with a draw? What will they need? So I cooked up a little recipe in my head. I think it starts with Sharita Spitza leading the defense, and and more importantly, kind of like leading the charge mm-hmm. to play a very physical brand of football against Chelsea in the defensive third. I think Kaylee DeSanders, she looked a little shaky early in the group stage. Her play has improved massively as she's grown into the season. Mm-hmm. Let's get our, uh, let's get a great DeSanders game. So I'll throw that in there as well. Nadine Nordum, Lily Johannes, you already know, they're going to defend. They're going to take the ball from you, and they're going to look to get it upfield. Chastity Grant, Hook Strong in the wings, they're going to want to play going forward. They're going to want to be aggressive. They're going to want to be out in space. But to me, I think the ultimate X factor for me, and we saw her really shine against FC20, Romy Lukter. Mm. You mentioned that big win over FC20, who was leading the league by a good margin. So this was a big game. Uh, Lukter had a gorgeous goal to break the seal on that one. She also notched an ITC record book assist with her near-perfect header, bonks off the crossbar before getting converted into the easiest of rebounds for Nadine Nordum. And we've also seen her shine in Champions League. 
just turned 23 years old, so you can always expect some variance with younger players. But I think if she has an A-plus game or maybe just an A game, I think Ajax can beat Chelsea this week. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, Especially, you know, you have the home crowd behind you. It's almost kind of like the the NBA thought process. Younger players, they always tend to play a little better at home too. So that'll be really interesting to see. And they've had really great crowds at Ajax during the group stage uh, yeah. and domestically. So I think not surprising to see that they've come out in such droves and you know gobbled up so many of those tickets. I think they're going to bring it. We've got a couple Ajax fans in our audience that I'm sure are going to let us know exactly what the vibes are like. And I'm happy that this one kicks off the week. How cool is that? Oh, yeah. Perfect match to to kick off the week, I think. So let's talk about who they're matched up with. Uh, Chelsea Football Club. They've won their last four. They were clipped by my Manchester City Football Club 1-0 in February. But then they went on to kind of avenge that loss uh, in the League Cup. The complexion of of this game and really kind of Chelsea's season changed uh, with the devastating news of me official's injury broke. Uh, That happened in late February. However, they did gain Kat Macario, who seems to be uh, rounding into form since she returned from her injury. Uh, she scored a couple goals in the, in the few games that she's been back. You know, Macario is just always going to be super smart, in the right spot, and very opportunistic, as any great number nine usually is. But Chelsea as a whole, man, I mean, we talk about the official injury. They're kind of a rolling mash unit right now. Myra Ramirez and defender Natalie Bjorn uh, as well as Marin Mielda, all missed Friday's 3-1 victory over your arsenal. My condolences. It's all right. <laughs> you, you stack those three injuries on top of the absence of Sam Kerr and Millie Bright, and, you know, we're talking about Ajax with a, with a home field advantage, with young players who are looking to make a name for themselves. You know, this one in Amsterdam could get real interesting real quickly. I 100% agree with that. When I think about this Chelsea side... Kind of, it's easy to think about who they've lost because super talents that they've lost to injury, unfortunately. But you can still look at all the players <laughs> that make the eleven <laughs> and the yeah. people on their bench, and you're just like, all right, they still have like 17 really good players that can come in and affect the match. We've talked about this lineup up and down. Props to Chelsea who gave my Gunners that work on Friday. That was yeah. a little rough to see. We talked about some keys on the Ajax side for Chelsea, though. To me, their keys are up in the front seat because between Lauren James, Girl Wrighton. And Joanna Canarud, I feel like if two of those three have a good game, it's really tough to beat this side. And the three I mentioned, LJ Wright and Canarud, all three of those attacking players can obviously finish, but they're all tremendous passers and playmakers as well, Mm -hmm. which only makes Chelsea's like other seven that much more dangerous. Aaron Cuthbert, rock solid in the middle. Chelsea's defense, though, even though Hannah Hampton's been on fire lately, without Millie Bright, who you mentioned, I think Chelsea's back line versus Ajax front three is a pretty even matchup maybe even slight edge to Ajax. So I think that is where Chelsea can get gotten, basically. And again, if Ajax plays to their potential, Lily's out there cooking, maybe Ajax gets that production they're looking for from Romy Romy Lukter. And uh, I mean, if those hit, I think Chelsea might just be heading back to West London with some real work left to do to stay alive in this tournament. I think it's super, super live. And you never know, like if if you start to get that production from Lukter, Chastity Grant is pretty opportunistic in her own right, too. So great players all over the pitch, both sides. I mean, goddamn, what a great game to start the quarterfinals with. Let's go. This is just one of the four, too. I can't wait. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you called out Veard, and they're going to miss her big time. But a lot of talent on the IX side as well. It's going to be a great environment. And just excited to see this one going down Tuesday, March 19th, 1.45 p.m. Eastern. Let's shift gears. Match number two on Tuesday. One of my squads against one of your squads. Rewinding all the way back to our UEFA Champions League preview. My squad, Benfica, they are hosting Lyon. What do we need to know about this one? This one's in that second slot on Tuesday, 4 p.m. Eastern. I'm jealous that Benfica is your squad. I mean, they're your squad in terms of that's who, you know, when we were breaking up the groups and what groups we were focusing on. I want to, like, if there's any room, I'm trying to chase (laughs) down the Benfica bandwagon. Like, hold on, let me on there too. I'm going to grab the ITC personal record book. Benfica, our squad. Let's go. (laughs) All right. I appreciate that. (laughs) Welcome aboard. All right. Excellent. So I do think Benfica could use some Kika Nazareth sorcery in this one. Mm -hmm. We talked a couple weeks ago about her uh, insane scorpion kick. She's looked to be in good form uh, recently, but Leon is still Leon. As much as I appreciate you allowing me to get onto the bandwagon, Leon is 2-0 since they returned to play in March. 
Uh, that included a 4-0 victory over Fleury on Friday. But when you have Kika Nazareth on the field, Jessica Silva, their kind of creative attacking style, I think you are, you're always going to have a chance. And, and you pointed it out with Ajax, they're going to be playing at Benfica in this one in Portugal. So as the newcomer to the squad, obviously you have more of the Benfica background. What can you tell us about like what kind of this dynamic squad should be looking to do against Leon? Yeah. So a couple of things at play here. You obviously mentioned one huge one, Kika Nazareth, Kika Magic, whatever you want to call her. She's back in the Benfica mix in a huge way. You may recall she missed Benfica's final two group stage matches against Hosengard and Barcelona. Benfica able to advance to the quarterfinals anyway. Uh, they've been on a bit of a tear, man, through their domestic league, El Campeonato Nacional Femenino or Liga BPI. The sponsors are listening. Uh, since Kika's return, two goals and two starts. Let's go. And she also made an appearance as a sub in the 62nd minute of Benfica's win over Famali Cao. Now, I know Lyon has all the talent, and if they play anywhere near their potential, they'll make quick work of this Benfica side, even in Portugal. But I do think for Lyon to prevail on Tuesday, they're going to have to play the match on their terms. So like lots of high quality possession, lots of Basha ball, Diani active in dangerous areas, Ada Hegerberg aggressive, continual pressure on the defense from her. It really just depends on what this game looks like. Mm. If it looks more wide open, more kind of like gunslinging and we're kind of going up and down, that really does favor Benfica. One last interesting note, and these formations are courtesy of our friends at FB Ref. In Benfica's first group stage match against Barcelona, they went with a back four. Kika, who you mentioned, Jessica Silva, who you also mentioned, up top. They got mushed in that one. 5-0. No chance. Mm. Over before it started. They then switched to a back three kept that shape for the remaining five group stage matches, which included their 4-4 slugfest with Barcelona and a ticket to the quarterfinals. I'm going to be really interested to see how Benfica line up against this Lyon side because I think how they set up just out of the gate is going to be pretty telling. And again, if they play, if this is a wide open, up and down kind of match, I think it really does favor Benfica. If Lyon kind of big sister, little sisters, this Benfica side controls the match, controls the ball, could be a long... 180 minutes for Benfica. We'll see. So it's really going to just going to come down to who gets to play this one their way. Yeah, that's a great point. I th- I trying to think back to that um, to that episode after. I think the Benfica Barcelona match, the first one, that was the one where I think you had said, "Wow, Benfica is zero percent scared of Barcelona." And then after a few <laughs> minutes, you were like, "They should have been a little scared of Barcelona." <laughs> <laughs> Should have been like 20, 25%. Yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you, I, the formation piece, that's awesome, man. That is such great insight because, you know, this team, they they don't play lacking confidence. And so when mm-hmm. you when you say, you know what, screw it, we want to put another person in the midfield or uh, get another person forward, and you look at those three defenders and you go, it's on you now. Like, we, we're going to need you three to be able to hold up. And do you look at your midfielders and say, I need you to track back when you got to track back. And then you got to get forward when you got to get forward. I thought there was something really interesting that uh, Leon manager Sonia Bon Pastor said. Her parents are originally from northern Portugal. Uh, bon Pastor was born in, hmm. in France, at least according to, to what I had read. But, but her parents are uh, native Portuguese. She said, quote, My entire Portuguese family supports Benfica and has this club in their blood. We played two years ago. My family had the opportunity to travel and will be there again. She went on to say, Hmm. quote, This tie allows us to face a good team, which drew 4-4 with Barcelona in the last group stage match. They have a philosophy of play with great attacking qualities, so we will have to be very cautious. Portuguese women's football is progressing well, and the clubs are becoming stronger. End quote. Sonia, I don't know if you've been listening to the program, but we've been talking about Portugal for several months now and couldn't agree more. And like I realize some of those some of those might sound like coach speak, some of those might sound like coach quotes, but Bon Pastor is the manager of like the second most elite club in the world. And yeah. she knows exactly what the fuck she's talking about. And I think the extra piece of that, of her having that little bit of Portuguese heritage, is she knows what football is there, like intimately. So for her to talk about their philosophy of play with great attacking qualities, I don't think that's coach speak. I think she's telling the players at Lyon, if you screw around with this, we might be looking at a 2-2 draw or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think... I was surprised. The the part of her quote that kind of surprised me was her inkling that they had to be very cautious. 
Mm. Because if that's the case and we get a more, let's say, responsible Leon attack, you know, maybe they want to just kind of hold the ball a little bit more and, you know, pick their spots a little bit better. That can also play into Ben Pika's hands a little bit. Because I think yeah. if they're any kind of percent out of their normal flow, I think that really helps Benfica, you know, like, and I think you just wonder if the Portuguese lineage, like sort of like some of the juju around it, the family, you know, like you just wonder kind of how that stuff starts to bubble a little bit. So that part really, I don't know, that one, that one perked my antennas a little bit. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting the way she framed it. Um, I will be looking for, we talk about with this Leon side every time. Like, I don't know if there's like our Michael Jordan type antics in the locker room. I'm not talking about like, illegal gambling or like anything <laughs> like that but and you know for for the record Dino and I extremely pro gambling legal gambling of course of course is there any yeah yeah I didn't even know illegal gambling existed um do you ever think Diani and Hegeberg and Basha and Haran look at each other and go how fast can we score today because they try in those Champions League group stage games, and you see it in in uh, D one F too. I mean, they they score within twelve minutes, pretty yeah. often. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm watching out for that. That's a great point. I mean, I think this Benfica side, especially if they're in a back three playing on the front foot, I mean, mm-hmm. they're going to be prone to give it up a quick one. I mean, Lyon's mm-hmm. definitely got, they've snuck a couple in under the ten minute mark in the group stage, and they're just just that dangerous the problem is that everybody can score everybody's really good <laughs> everybody's really <laughs> smart a lot of bunch of high iq players um so i think that's something that benfica is gonna have to protect against leon as i mentioned all the talent in the world they're gonna be a super tough out but let's not forget they did get bounced from this tournament in the quarterfinals last year when they couldn't get past chelsea and that was pretty much with their whole squad so while leon does dominate d1f year in year out they did run off four straight Champions League titles. Last one of the four was in 2019. They've only gotten out of the quarterfinals twice since then. I think they've got three exits at this stage in the quarterfinals last five years. Mm-hmm. Still, though, for Benfica, tall task. But I don't know. Getting a funny feeling that Leon might be gettable this week by this Benfica side. What do you think about that? I love your spirit. I mean, let's go. I mean, our spirit. This, you love our spirit. Uh, our <laughs> spirit. Go. Yes, yes, yes. I'm on the bandwagon. I mean, you know, this is what this is what happens when you play the. This is the beauty of the home and home. I'm gonna stick to my point. I think I think the first 18 minutes of this match kind of give us the window of how the rest are gonna go. Like crazy atmosphere. There are gonna be nerves, but then there's gonna be energy from Benfica. And then Leon in their constant race of can they score a goal within 25 seconds of of the match starting? <laughs> so how does that look? And then you know we get to that that kind of like first stage of the match, the first round to use some boxing parlance uh, that you might appreciate. I think that will tell us how this will go. I think that's a great insight um, because right around that 20 minute mark, that Barcelona, that first Barcelona match that you mentioned, that was when I think it was already two 0 at that point. Mm-hmm. That was then when Alexia poached the uh, SP Brooks goal, and I think oh, Salma got one, you know, right after that. So they uh, Benfica not able to survive those first twenty minutes, and we already know how dangerous Leon is. Um, I think that's a great call. Let's let's lock into you know that that first period, see who's kind of dictating the style of the match, mm. and I think that'll give us great insight into what we can expect. Again, this one going down Tuesday, March nineteenth, four p.m. Eastern. Let's go ahead to Wednesday. BK Hacken hosting. PSG. I've gone back and forth on this one. I think I spun myself into multiple circles just trying to figure out where this tie kind of ends up, just because I think I've talked myself into every single scenario. You know, Hacken's defense kind of smothers PSG's offensive attack and athleticism just too much to handle for Hacken. You know, weather might get crazy. Who knows? I mean, I, I think I've I've looked under every single rock, you know, in terms of trying to trying to predict this matchup. Where's your head at with these two teams? I'm 100% with you. I mean, there is a very, very wide range of outcomes for this matchup, mm. I think. Um, especially when you consider, like you mentioned, like the the weather in Gothenburg uh, could be unpredictable. It looked like, I was trying to look at some of the forecasts, it looked like they've been hitting like 40 degrees Fahrenheit most of these days, which for a dude who lives in Seattle is totally fine <laughs> in my view. Uh, you can play that. That's pretty good football weather, if you ask me. I do have a feeling, based on the other Champions League matches that we've seen in Gothenburg, it's going to be a hostile environment for PSG. 
There's going to be mm-hmm. they're gonna be chanting. They're going to be loud. They're going to be getting on the refs. They're, they're going to be doing very good football fandom stuff. Uh, so I'm excited to see that. I feel like the reason that you and I are keep just kind of going in circles and circles on this one, this is the most styles makes fightsist fixture of the bunch. <laughs> like when you talk about PSG's like racing attack up and down the field, open play versus hacking, you know, rely on a great back four, rely on a great keeper, beat you up in the midfield, but then try to get the ball out to Yusaba and, and create some offense. I think it just creates 20 different ways the match could play out. 20 different ways the match could play out and end up being 1-0 either way or (laughs) (laughs) 1-1. And then we get there and we're like, okay, yeah, we could have saw that coming. But there's there's such a range that um, I'm with you. I think it's okay for us to say, not too sure how this one's going to look. Yeah, a lot of different roads lead to 1-0 or 1-1 for sure. I totally agree mm-hmm. with you. Another fun wrinkle, you mentioned the crowd. The Damos Fenskin season doesn't start up until April 13th. Mm-hmm. So look out, Norshaping, because this hack inside is going to use this little stroll through the Champions League as a nice little preseason warm-up. Uh, and something tells me that without domestic league football in Gothenburg, that crowd's going to be pining for some action. And it's got to be so cool. Yeah a month before the season starts to have Champions League just going on, you know, like Russ versus Russ. We always have a fun conversation around that. <laughs> on the field, though, I think PSG is really going to test Jennifer Falk in spots. Despite the brilliance we've seen from Hacken defensively, I just think the PSG attack is so potent. And side note, you called out Tapa the Chuinga's sister, Temwa Chuinga, as a player to look out for in her debut for the Kansas City Current in the NWSL. And buddy, it took her mere seconds to impact the game and create a goal for her team. <laughs> Unreal call from you. Take a victory lap. Could I Could I just say that in that NWSL preview, I mentioned I want to see Temwa Chewinga play because she's Tabitha Chewinga's sister. I failed to mention <laughs> in her league season last year, I think Temwa Chewinga scored 60 goals. Uh, if I heard uh, Leanne Sanderson correctly on that Kansas City Current broadcast. So I failed to mention like, oh yeah, the, the, she's not just Tabitha's sister. She's a fucking incredible player on her own. But the speed in that family is something to behold. They're both roadrunners out there. Born to play football 1,000%. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, you know, also no learning curve, just right onto the pitch, right into fifth gear. <laughs> right the ball right into the back of the net unbelievable to watch right. let's slide back to europe though again i think this psg attack we're gonna have to see how patient they're able to stay if hacken is able to take away their breakaway opportunities and stay set stay disciplined defensively which we know that they can do watching them move as a unit defensively is just marvelous you yep. can see why they give teams so much trouble they're so disciplined. They're they're not sort of scrambly. And I think they can make it tough on PSG. But at the same time, you know, those race cars at PSG are just yeah. tough to wrangle for 90 plus minutes. Uh, and I think that's kind of what the match is going to come down to. You also touched on the weather pretty briefly. This one's got the potential to be one of those icy NFC North type matchups. Currently projected mm-hmm. to hover right around 38 degrees Fahrenheit with evening showers looming over the forecast. Could make it a real test for PSG. I mean, for people enjoying this uh, women's football podcast with us, especially uh, talking about the UEFA Women's Champions League, this reference may be lost on some folks. I I feel like Dino might appreciate this. So in American football, there is this famous fixture, this famous match between a team uh, called the Oakland Raiders and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the weather was shitty. And the owner of the Oakland Raiders, a gentleman by the name of Al Davis, for any of our international football fans, just Google Al Davis and just read some stuff about Al Davis. Uh, <laughs> let's, an eccentric guy, we'll, we'll say, was complaining vigorously to the commissioner of the sport because he was accusing the Pittsburgh Steelers, who play in a cold weather climate, for basically icing down their pitch to slow down Oakland's attack because Oakland's attack was built on speed and pace and so I don't know at at BK Hacken are they like oh maybe it's not gonna Mm. maybe it's not gonna rain in Gothburg tonight but maybe we'll just sprinkle a little water on there maybe just try (laughs) to slow down these race cars I don't know how much NFL history they've paid attention to but you know it it might be one strategy to try to slow them down yeah I can see it now just 
couple dudes on the on the on the roof of the <laughs> got the sprinkler, you got the hose kind of spraying down onto the field. Uh keeping things nice and slick down there. Mm-hmm. This one's gonna be one to watch. I just calling this the the styles make fightiest fight of fights was is just so on point. Because this this a lot like Benfica Leon is going to come down to who's getting to play football their way. You know, and I think one yeah. name that we haven't mentioned, Rosa Kafaji. Like she slices up any defense. Like it doesn't really matter. Like it, she's impossible to hold too, and she's doing it in the midfield. You know, just creating yeah. chances for her wingers uh, and her forwards, and she can score. So I mean, I think just as quickly as PSG can get out ahead, I can see one of those Jennifer Fox stops turning into a Kafaji break. Maybe Yusuba gets on the end of one, and now now we've got something going. A little bit of rain, not too much rain. You know, I think it's still a little traumatized from USA Canada and the Gold Cup. Get me to Tuesday. Get me to Wednesday. I cannot wait to take all these matches in. Absolutely phenomenal. I'm just taking a quick look. Uh, PSG they played Saint Etienne. Yesterday, we're recording this on Sunday. They played on Saturday. Uh, I mean, we haven't said her name yet. I know she's one of your absolute favorite players in the Champions League. Grace Gayoro scored two goals in, in their last match in their 5 0 victory over St. Etienne. So, with all those race cars that you have running up and down, you have Grace Gayoro whipping perfect passes to them. But oh, yeah, don't focus too much on that because she might just drill it in the back of the net, too. So, yeah, unbelievable talent. On both sides here, again, another absolute primetime matchup. Yeah, last thing on this one, we talked about maybe Ajax's front three against Chelsea's back line being somewhat of a toss-up. Mm. I think this one is like slides right into that co-main event where it's like, I want to see oh, yeah. PSG's attackers against Hacken's back line and Falk. Like absolutely. Let's see, let's see who wins that battle because that is going to be knockdown drag out. I think when we do see something, it's going to feel pretty magical. It's going to take something big time to kind of break through in this one. And it could happen from either side. Totally agree. I th- somebody's walking away and, you know, maybe it's maybe it's silly to call this before, but this is one of those matches where one fan base walks away and they could have a lasting memory about a player of like, yo, you remember when that person did that in that big spot? Like this has every part of the recipe for that. Yeah, 100%. Again, this one going down Wednesday, March 20th, 1.45 p.m. Eastern. Cannot wait for this one to kick off. All right, man. One more match to go. A team that we've watched very closely against another I team mean, we've watched right. very closely. We've watched, we've watched all the teams closely. We know <laughs> what team we're watching the most closely. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't mean to be rude. That's enough of this silly. Enough of this silliness. Look. All right, man, we know what podcast this is. Let me get the mic out of the way. We know what kind of goddamn podcast we're running here. So we're talking about the bullies from Bergen. That's a little ridiculous. I mean, I think what it's clear it's it's clear you don't care at all about your your journalistic credentials, any kind of journalistic ethics anymore. I mean, you just seem to be I mean, you you kind of joke about being in the tank for Braun, but doing a pod with in a Braun jersey is what it looks like. That's Come on. Let's go. That's a little uh that's a little borderline. You know what? Let's fucking go. <laughs> We're in our projects. Yes. <laughs> We're doing this. Fucking go time. We're back. We are so back. Champions League is back. Bronze back. Barcelona. They have officially been put on notice. This one going down Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern, which, if my math is correct, 9 p.m. in Bergen. So Oh wow. Will weather be a factor? Sounds like it's going to be a little dark. Sounds like it's going to be a little cold. We're, and we're going to see just how much that might affect this Barcelona side. I cannot be more pumped for this one. I mentioned at the top, prime time slot for a prime time matchup. What do we need to know about this matchup? When I was looking up info on UEFA's ludicrous fine against Braun, I came across a news website that appears to be uh, based in Norway for all our pals uh, over there in Norway. Please let me know if I'm if I'm wrong on this. Uh, but that website has a VG uh, as the name and on the logo from what I can see. And it had an article which gave me a good synopsis of the whole fine situation, which remains silly from UEFA, uh, the UEFA mafia. Uh, But what I found at the bottom of that article, and obviously I'm viewing this website, it's being translated, Google Translate, uh, into English. I'm not yet uh, fluent in Norwegian. Working on it. (laughs) Working on it. There is a headline from an opinion piece, 
And uh, it was from February 6th after the knockout round draw. And the headline to this article said, and I quote, Braun meets Barcelona in quarterfinals, worst possible opponent, (laughs) end quote. So that guy, you know, I'm sure he's a nice fella. Get with it, man. We're not coming in here talking about (laughs) the worst possible opponents. We're not going in there to lose. What are we talking about? This is a this is the club from Bergen. These are the bullies that we're talking about. This is a team that wasn't even supposed to be here. Was the lowest ranked team. They're the lowest possible coefficient going into the Champions League. Out the window. Let's go. We play attacking football. We play audacious football, and we're going to do it against Barcelona too. I mean, it's quite possible you misread it. Could be that <laughs> this was Barcelona's worst op- worst possible Good. opponent. I mean, I don't know. You know, Google Translate not not the uh, the most trustworthy piece of mm-hmm. software that we've got on the internet. We just need to let that journalist know. You know, now is not the time. Quarterfinals. Now is not the time. We need to crank it all the way up. We need max volume. Speaking of max volume, in the building on Wednesday. Let's go. I mean, come on. That place is going to be wild. You know, perusing this VG website, and again, I hope I hope the people, please, uh, I hope our pals in Norway, just be friendly when you mock me, like, this is our CNN, or like, whatever it is, just like, let me know. <laughs> I'm, to- I'm totally ignorant. I've been to Norway once, and it was just stopping at a layover in the Oslo airport on my way over to Stockholm. Again, no disrespect to Norway. We're getting out there. We're going to get out there eventually. I've always wanted to see it. I've heard it's a beautiful country. I've heard it's very clean. I've heard a lot of good things about Norway. I want to check it out. But I haven't been there. But what I have heard on this website that I am now trusting, and hopefully somebody doesn't come back and say, hey, VG, all fake news. Please don't believe anything <laughs> that's on there. Um, so I'm hope, fingers crossed I'm not, I haven't been totally fooled by the internet. But they had also mentioned, and you guys had mentioned it to us too in the comments, you guys like sold out the place in record time. Like people are amped for this thing. Like Barcelona's gonna walk into this thing, and Barcelona's played big matches before. They've won the Champions League before. They they win Liga F all the time. But they're gonna walk into this this smaller arena that's just gonna be a beehive. It's just gonna mm-hmm. be a cauldron of pressure. Yeah. And it's gonna be really interesting to see how they deal with it. Yeah, and I think Barcelona strikes me as the kind of side. You know, we're not really calling any of their professionalism into question. I'm going to try to sure. try to break this down more seriously now. I think they do strike me as a kind of side that won't be afraid to go back to Barcelona needing some kind of result. You sure. know, because they're going to have the confidence. All right, we need three goals. We can get three. If we need four or five, we can get four or five. Now, if that's actually the case, we'll just have to see. But I do think that there is a pathway for them to maybe not take this one super duper max level serious um sure. just knowing that braun's gonna have to go back to barcelona for the reverse fixture and that could be a great recipe for i don't know <laughs> generational type upset uh even though you know obviously the odds are what they are but i don't know man like could be one of those magical seasons for braun now we do have to mention they did open their season mm-hmm. <laughs> can you tell us can you tell us a little bit about what we saw from Braun, our side, match day one. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, they took on uh, LSK in match day one of Top Syrian, which we got to find a way. Like, maybe we can appeal to our guy, Cam Pope, and say, look, who can we talk to at the zone to get Top Syrian on the zone broadcast in America? The people want it over here. And by the people, I definitely mean me and you, but I'm sure there are other folks around here oh, who, yeah. who would be happy to see a, a league that obviously has great players in it. So, I digress a little there, only to uh, delay myself from having to get into the fact that uh, Braun did lose to LSK 4-2 uh, on match day one, not the start they wanted. But I'm not worried about that because, I mean, you're a fan of the Miami Heat. And when they got LeBron James, I believe you guys started that first season 9-8 and eight, and the sky was falling and this isn't going to work and all that stuff. Well, I just want to remind folks, especially over here, and shout out to all our, our pals over in Norway who talked to us about this. Anna Nurland Ajem was the leading goal scorer in Top Syrian last year. Uh, and Braun did not win Top Syrian. Uh, they made it into this Champions League uh, through the qualification stages. Anna was playing for Lynn in Top Syrian last season. And like I mentioned, was the leading goal scorer in the league with 13 goals. Where does she end up signing? 
buddy, she's in Bergen now. So now she's going to be top of the diamond for us, number nine. And I'm just going to start saying our, I'm going to start saying we, fuck it. I mean, we got the jerseys on. We're Pat, we're way past the point of no return at this point. <laughs> and we're not even interested in the point of no return. Um, let's get reckless. <laughs> let's get let's get reckless. Um <laughs> Ajem is definitely the striker. She'll be the number nine. The rest of the core is still intact. Now you got to deal with Eichland. You got to deal with Keeland. You got to deal with Gaupset. You have all these other pieces around Ajem. I feel like this is a recipe to score some goals. They're going to need to score some goals against Barcelona. They're going to need to hold the ball. I think they can hopefully do that in a protective way uh, while still understanding that Barcelona, they're going to have more possession I have some thoughts on possession later. I'm filibustering. I'm excited. I'm way too (laughs) excited about this match. Let me just pass the ball back to you. What do we got to do to win? But maybe let me reframe that. How many goals are we winning by on Wednesday? I don't know, man. It feels like a two or three. Mm -hmm. I'm of two minds. Maybe of three minds. With regards to how many goals we're talking about here. Uh, In all seriousness, though, in the U.S., for our, uh, our friends in Bergen, We have fixtures on the calendar that are sometimes referred to as a trap game. Mm. Trap games happen when there's a huge game looming, maybe like against a bitter rival, super important match for positioning within the table, or in this case, I don't know, a Champions League match against maybe the greatest team ever assembled. I digress. The trap game usually happens before that monster matchup and usually comes with a higher probability of losing or suffering some type of letdown. Definite trap game vibes that Saturday loss to LSK. Wild environment. Like they were playing, I'm not sure. I mean, like from what I can tell, that looked like some sort of terror dome indoor, you know, <laughs> like, you can hear the sound echoing off in, in very like creepy, echoey. Like it was a wild environment. Awesome. When we do get to Norway, we've got to hit some of these terror domes as part, as part of our journey. We got to check out Bronze New Stadium. Should be opened up real soon, according to a, a lot of our uh, friends and listeners who chimed in. But like I said, definite trap game vibes in that loss. Aurora Mickelson, she was peppered by shots early. Then she gets beat by a 45-yard chippy that just shouldn't really happen. Uh, right. But I was proud of our squad. Cecile reddish Kwame, she muscled the ball past LSK's keeper in very brawn fashion, just outpowered her with a ball in. And then uh, one of your favorite players, Raquel Engesvik, she unleashed an absolute screamer to even the game at two before Braun goes on to give up two more goals, drop points in this one. Braun had some second half chances, but really kind of an uncharacteristic performance from their defense, I think sunk them in this one. I will say, silver lining, better to get this one under your belt before Barcelona comes to town. Just work out those kinks. Just work them all the way out. Break down some film. We've got a couple days to kind of reposition, get into more mid-season form. Uh, I'm kind of glad they got this one out of their system. I think that's a great way to look at it. And and yeah, the trap game vibes, that is so well done. I didn't even think about it in those terms. I think you're 100% right. Because of course, what are you preparing for the most? Like, yeah, this is the start of our league season. This is an important match. But you have several other matches after that. Like, there's no Braun player going to sleep at night and not thinking about Barcelona before they mm. before their head hits the pillow. So... I'm with you on the trap game. I think Engesvik, I, I, I'm glad you point her out. And I talk about it a lot with footballers because they're the type of players I like. I mean, I've mentioned on the show before, like Brazilian Ronaldo. Like, I loved him. I loved Abby Wambach. Like, I obviously love Megan Rapino. Like, I love those players that are just like, it's my time now. Like, I'm going to go out here. I'm going to do the step over. I'm going to do the skills. I'm going to I'm gonna try a, a tricky pass. I'm going to try something that – I'm going to try a back heel – Whatever it is, Angus Vick has that in her game. We haven't even talked about Senia Galpset yet at any real length. She's going to go out there looking to establish her physical dominance, I think. Um, I think she'll be lowering the shoulder into people and trying to use that incredible skill that she has. And hopefully that can open up things for Ajem down the field. Yeah, and I think Barcelona, I suppose we should talk about them. Yeah, they're good. The Galpset points, <laughs> the Galpset points important. I think we saw when Barcelona had Ingrid Engen on the back line, she made things a little vulnerable back there. So she's a little bit out of position. Uh, She had her difficulties. We'll see what kind of form she's in. And if she's even in that spot, I think Barcelona's got some players working their way back from injury. Three straight wins after the Valentine's Day draw against Levante for Barca. In these three matches, 
They outscore Atleti, Real Sociedad, and Tenerife 16 goals to one. Mm. Alexia Puteos, she's working her way back. Two goals in these three matches. Sama Pariuelo never left. Five goals in, in her most recent two matches. But it's still going to be a low of 32 degrees. A little bit of rain. Some possible snow in the forecast on Wednesday. You mentioned the weather might be unpredictable. Well, there's a little prediction for you weather-wise. Uh, and that 9 p.m. local start time, that's going to be real spooky. <laughs> I can't wait mm-hmm. to just see the vibes uh, and really kind of see how this Barcelona side responds to just the grueling style of play that Braun's going to try to put them through. I know it's a different club, but I, I my mind keeps going back to Real Madrid looked uncomfortable playing in Gothenburg in Sweden. Yep. And I don't mean to conflate Sweden and Norway, but I mean, the, there are some parallels here. And so... Yeah, I you know that that sun goes down. I mean, I live in a in a pretty northern city here in the states, up in Seattle, Washington. The sun goes down; it goes from like a comfortable temperature in the forties to a significantly less comfortable temperature in the forties because now you don't have the sun out and the wind is whipping. Mm. I can really get to somebody who's who's uh, used to a warmer climate. So I think Bron's going to have to lean all the way into that. Yeah, that kind of reminds me too, when you mentioned the win point, we've seen Barcelona rip shots from distance pretty consistently. Mm. You know, last time we saw them in the Champions League, 4-4 draw with Benfica, and since then, another draw against Levante. Um, They haven't quite been able to work the ball all the way in, like well within the 18, to kind of get these easy looks. Like I'm I'm kind of thinking back to like the first Benfica match, where they were just getting stuff, they were getting wherever they wanted. That has changed a little bit. Now, Barcelona is skilled enough where they can just rip shots, you know, Pina, it could be whoever. Right. Dente, like they've got so much talent. The ball can fly in from anywhere. But all of a sudden now, weather's a little tricky. The footing's a little tricky. It's windy. Now those, you know, 20, 22, 25 yard shots, a lot harder to nail, you know, and I think if Braun's able to pack it in, be opportunistic on the break going the other way, could be in for something really, really interesting. I think this one's going to be close. You know, all jokes aside, I think we we have a lot of fun with like fanning out <laughs> like, with our brawn gear. But <laughs> I, I mean, I'm talking about our previous <laughs> episodes. Now, you know, we we've, we've got that all of our system. You know, we're right down the middle now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I do think this one's going to be close. I think this one's going to be w- within a goal. You know, maybe two goals back to one goal uh, late into the match. This one's. I, I just kind of feel like Barcelona hasn't shown straight killer instinct all 90 minutes. All the time, you know, they 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 kind of crank it up in spots. I'm thinking more about that second half against Frankfurt. You know, when Frankfurt mm. jumps out to a lead and like now in a 15, 16 minute span, they notch three goals and slam the door shut. That kind of killer instinct, we've seen it in spots. You know, now that we're in the knockout stage and the stakes are, they only go up from here. Very good chance that we can see that killer instinct extended through the course of a match or through multiple matches. But I do want to see it. And I think Braun's going to make it tough on them. So I, I definitely, in my heart of hearts, I am expecting a pretty close match in this one. I mean, I think so. When they played Leon at home, I think that is the kind of analog that we're, that's the comparison point that we're yep. using. And yeah, Lindsay Horan lost her temper. And as I said, as I was watching the match, I thought lost her goddamn mind when she shoved <laughs> a Braun player directly in front of the referee got red carded and got you know sent off uh leading to the Braun helping lead to the Braun draw but yeah I mean I I think that they they were playing Leon close when it was 11 on 11 and and that Leon match so totally you know obviously we enjoy our our new friends from Norway we appreciate you guys supporting the program but I mean this is not like this is football this is this is styles make fights like we talked about like this is Barcelona going into, uh, this might be an American term, but we call it like a band box. I think that's a baseball term of like this small stadium where people like, it feels like the fans are on top of you. They're screaming at you. So I think it's going to be very interesting. And if I could leave one, one disclaimer to great friend of the pod, MLS architect, who is dropping knowledge in the YouTube comments, is dropping great like historical insight and has like really smart opinions and, and just kind of helps us out as we go through. Pal, we know you're a Spain fan. We know you're a Barcelona fan. You knew what you were getting into when we were going to do this show. You know we're in the tank for Braun. No disrespect 
to your Catalans. Look, we're just on opposite sides on this one. We appreciate you. Thank you for, for always helping out the show, always leaving comments and stuff. If Barcelona wins, I mean, I don't even want to speak it into, ex- into existence, but we'll be good sports if Braun wins. I make you that promise. Hopefully you'll reciprocate. Yeah, I'm not with you on that. I'm not going to be a good sport. I'm going to be a bad sport. <laughs> I'm going to put some tables in this bitch. (laughs) We're going nuts if they win. It would be one of the greatest upsets in the history of football, and we will be here for it. 100%. Yeah, this one going down Wednesday, the 20th of March, 4 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. local time. Cannot wait. And also in this episode, we cover the other three matchups. Benfica hosting Lyon, PSG visiting BK Hacken, Chelsea visiting Ajax, and a little NWSL talk. Season kicked off this weekend with a bang. Your boy, Mr. Grand Angle, he was in the building watching the Seattle rain from a very choice vantage point, and he's got some thoughts. We'll talk about that later. So like if you liked, subscribe if you enjoyed talking women's football with your boys, and you want to hang out with us, whether you're a Braun fan, not a Braun fan, future Braun fan, there's plenty of room in the Into the Channel community, so make sure to subscribe. Those are the only categories. Braun fan, <laughs> not a Braun fan, future Braun fan. Those are the only the only categories. I was in, the, like you said, I was in the press box for Seattle Rain. No team colors in the press box. No cheering in the press box. Those are all very standard journalistic principles that I adhere to. Uh, don't have to adhere to those. I am a long way from Bergen, Norway. So whenever they score, whenever I'm going to just go on a limb, Whenever Angus Vick scores on Wednesday, we're kissing the crest. We're doing exactly what needs to be done. (laughs) Let's go. We're bringing it. All right. We'll see you guys there. Before we get out of here, opening weekend here in the States for the NWSL this weekend featured some absolute bangers. And you weren't just into the channel tonight, Mr. Grand Angle. You took your talents into the press box, into the building. You are just hours removed from watching your Seattle Rain open the season Tell me what you saw tonight at Lumen Field. Yeah, so from the press box, it turns out that's a pretty good view. Um, so I got to see the the whole field throughout the match. Uh, that that was quite helpful. It made one thing jump out to me uh, pretty early. So obviously, probably most folks tuning into this have seen uh, the rain defeated the Washington Spirit 1-0. Let's go. After Bethany Balser converted a penalty kick in the second minute of the match. Second minute. First match of the season, home opener, up 1-0. I don't know how you start any better than that. Jordan Haitamo is the one who drew the penalty. It was basically right off the kickoff. But as I was there and the game kind of started to develop, I was kind of thinking back to our preview pod and I was like, oh man, you know what? I talked about all the departures and I had in our doc, I had all those players that uh, the rain added. Uh, Top of that list was 33-year-old Ji so Young. Korean midfielder who played several seasons for a little football club called Chelsea over in England. Mm-hmm. Played a pretty significant role to all of the trophies that they were collecting over there uh, under Emma Hayes. And as I kind of thought, I was like, oh yeah, I, sh- I should have. That was a little bit of a miss in the preview. I should have mentioned all these players we added. Ji So Young was the best player on the pitch in this match for like 40 minutes. Well, she completely bossed the game. She was the fulcrum of the attack, knew exactly where to be, was pulling the ball back exactly when she needed to. The other new players who they added, Angarad James Turner from Wales, instant chemistry with Jess Fishlock, if you could believe that. Also, Lily Woodham, she also started in defense. All their club debuts all had immediate chemistry with the squad. Nice. Things were a little sleepy in the second half. The rain was able to protect the second half lead. Washington Spirit came on a little bit. Ashley Hatch, you already knew she was going to get her chances. You knew she was going to chase down every single ball that was out there. She played incredibly aggressively. The rain's defense was able to hold up. One other point I do want to just, I'm I'm going to put this on the take roulette wheel. Maybe it's just something to keep our eye out for. 17-year-old Emery Adamas for the Seattle rain. She is the first ever U18 signing for the club. When asked about that uh, in the press conference, Laura Harvey talked about the idea of making sure that the club had an infrastructure to take on a young player. Uh, And Harvey just really stressed, hey, we just wanted to make sure that we had everything in place so this young person is able to grow, still kind of experience their youth, but also come in and and learn how to be a professional. So other clubs have, have signed U18 players before. There is a U18 player provision in the NWSL uh, collective bargaining agreement and the rules from what I understand. And so, you know, for her to be the first one ever, I'm going to read a quote here that I uh, grabbed from manager Laura Harvey in the press conference. 
She's a left-footed wide player. Say less. <laughs> Not exactly what I expected <laughs> from Laura Harvey. Um, hey. But she also said, quote, I'm not going to put any pressure on her, but I'm excited to see her play. Uh, so uh, Adamas came on the on the pitch near the end of the match and immediately showed an attitude and an audaciousness on the ball. She pretty much came on and said, oh, yeah, I'm not letting the game come to me here. I'm taking the game. I'm going at my speed. She had fresh legs, fresh 17-year-old legs out there against a bunch of players who had already had to play eight minutes of injury time in the first half and then another eight minutes of injury time in the second half. And she was just out there running and gunning immediately. I love that. That's going to be exciting to watch. I feel like rewinding back to our preview, we definitely hit on a lot of the key player movement, some of the additions, but then there were so many that I was just like, okay, I'm like scrambling through my phone. I'm like, all right, where, who's this? Where did they come from? Yep. Just a massive week. I kind of sunk in to the uh, Casey Current Portland Thorns matchup, the one that kind of opened up the season. And um, Dabinia, Bia Zanarato, that link up is going to be deadly this year. They're so creative. They were just in space all the time, giving Portland fits. And then you called it, got to give you props on that one. Temo Chowinga, literally mm. seconds after coming into the match. She essentially creates a goal uh, and is heavily involved in what I believe was their fourth goal after that. She had a massive, massive impact on the game. She got to a ball she had no no business whatsoever getting to to get KC on the board with an extra one. And uh, one more key point on KC. We kind of zoomed in a bit to uh, Vladko Antonovsky. And we weren't the only ones. Color commentator Leanne Sanderson, who I love. She's always got great energy on the call. Yeah. She was calling for maybe more of a defensive strategy when they were up 5-1. And then wouldn't you know that the game is still super wide open and Portland pulls it to within two goals, 5-3. And there's still like almost 20 minutes left in the match. And all yeah. of a sudden, KC's got to kind of like lock back in uh, and do another 15, 20 minutes of defending. So she was right on the money there. Vlako, he delivers again. <laughs> just uh, more talking points. Uh, and then just zooming out, just a great weekend. Great action. A lot of different styles. A lot of young players. New additions uh, to be really excited about. This is going to be an awesome season. Absolutely. I mean, the the atmosphere at that KC current game was incredible. Oh, my God. Yeah. You could hear it through the broadcast easily. Um, a couple like other quick ones. Utah Royals FC had more than 20,000 people in attendance for their home opener versus Chicago. Wow. I think one of the big takeaways that I had today that I kind of saw toward the end of the rain match, I just kind of looked on my phone and saw it happen. Oshwala scores. Oshwala plays and Oshwala scores. Let's go. Bay FC beats Angel City 1-0 on the strength of that Oshwala goal. Something tells me we'll be talking about quite a few of those this season. Your Orlando Pride coming back from two goals down uh, without Bonda out there. So that's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, that was one of those. You guys are on the road. You're down 2-0. You come back and leave with a draw. That's a draw that feels like a win. Overcome a bullshit red card. Throw that in there. <laughs> Heart of a champion. Pride of a champion. What else can we say? We breed champions down here in Orlando. Damn right. Anything else you saw week one? I want to go back to the rain one more time. I did not ask this question in the press conference, and I don't think the journalist who did ask it was subtweeting me in, on the preview. Um, <laughs> I didn't catch a journalist's name, so I'll have, to, I'll have to introduce myself next time. But they had mentioned to manager Laura Harvey that some people talked about this year kind of being a bit of a rebuilding year. <laughs> <laughs> or a transitional year for the club. So Don't check the tapes, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> so I may have mentioned something like that on the preview. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But uh, to quote Laura Harvey again, quote, as long as I'm coach, we'll never rebuild. Mm. She says, go. <laughs> she, she went on to say, quote, we're evolving as a team. And later when talking about some of the players, she just said it would be unfair to say that someone is going to replace Megan Rapino, but the team is going to evolve. And I just thought, you know what? Rebuilding or transitional years, they they look different depending on the team. And, and you had nailed it um, when you talked about it in the last episode. Like Even depending on the franchise or depending on the club, some clubs are better at kind of handling these things than others. Laura Harvey, not here for the word rebuild. So uh, I think in more American parlance, she might say, we don't rebuild, we reload. So I get the feeling that that is the attitude she's taking. Well, I mean, she backed it up. 
three points yep. on opening day. So shout out to her and shout out to your Seattle Rain. Going to be a good season. Looking forward to it, man. I mean, you know, it's only it's only week one. We got a lot of a lot of matches to play, but awful lot of goals in this first week. It, it seems like we're going to be in for some heavy metal football. To quote another another great manager out there. Let's go. All right, man. I think we did it. This has been another episode of Into the Channel. Remember, subscribe or follow Into the Channel, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to watch or listen at ITC underscore pod on X. Big thanks to you for watching, listening, subscribing. Everyone listening right now, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You make the show 100% better. Grant, you mentioned our guy, Michael, who's always chiming in, always bringing the knowledge. We appreciate them and the rest of our community tremendously. We are thrilled to have each and every one of you hanging out with us. And a big thank you to my co-host, Never afraid to throw his journalistic credentials out the window. I can always just pick them up later. Like, I mean, if I'm going to be in the press box <laughs> for one match, I have the journalistic credentials there. And then when we're talking about Braun, right out the window, it's it's a it becomes a fan podcast at that point. So I'm here for it. God, we got a lot of great football to watch, man. I am just excited to be talking about it with you and uh, all the folks who, who are enjoying the program with us. Keep hitting us up. Keep educating us. And we will see you guys after the matches. 